Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and on today's episode, I'm joined by Shihan Desmond Diaz. I know we're going to have fun today because we always have fun. I, I've, I've been looking forward to talking to you for a long time, man. So glad that you're here. To the audience, stick around. This is going to be great. If you're new to the show, check out WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. That's where we drop all the stuff for the show. And check out Whistlekick.com. It's where we have links to everything that we do from our products that you can buy to our events to all the other projects that we're involved in. So, Des, thanks for being here, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I appreciate you. Uh, we met, I don't know, do we want to tell the story? Yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. All right. All right. So, so let me set the scene. So it's 2022 mm -hmm. and I'm in the Pacific Northwest. I'm, I'm in P Piala, Piala, yeah. Piala. Piala, yeah. Piala, Washington. Yeah, yeah. Piala, Washington. And I am at a school that has given us a, a, a number of folks who've been on the show and worked with Whistlekick and done some great things. And I'm, I'm teaching a session at this event. And this guy kind of sneaks in. And he doesn't say anything. He just kind of jumps in and he's doing his thing. And I'm like, who's this guy? Is this guy going to be a problem? Because if you've been, if, if you've ever had someone just kind of slip into what you're doing, it says something. You don't know what it says yet, but you're on guard. You're like, what's going on? What is this person about? Are they, do they have training? Are they trying to hide? Um, what's going, just what's going on? And it took about five minutes of watching how he moved to go, okay. I don't know if he's going to be a problem, but he's definitely trained before. He's done some stuff. And then it took about another five minutes to say he's not going to be a problem. Five minutes after that, I was like, can we be friends? <laughs> it really, it was very quick. Yeah. And I, I just, I had a, a, a wonderful time having you in that session and the conversations that we've had before, or rather after and since, um, we're, we're, a, we're of similar mind. Absolutely. And I'm I'm been looking forward to talking to you on the show for a while. Yeah, that was a a, a fun experience for me. Um, typically, when I'm in a new area, like even when I've moved to Florida or when I've moved to Washington, I try to get immersed in the martial arts scene mm -hmm. as much as I can. It was a little challenging to find people for a while. Um, when uh, I, I met Mike Shintaku, he mentioned the, the seminar. I said, oh, you know what, I'm going to go, but I I don't like to. Um, present as, I don't know, like pompous or arrogant. So I just want to come in as a humble guy. That's why I didn't wear my gi. I had it in the car if it was a requirement, but I just said, you know what? No one knows me. Let me just be on, be my best self, but be quiet, humble. I, I wanted to see if anybody would recognize that I did know anything. I knew when we were walking around, you kept looking like something's different over there. <laughs> And, you know, some of those black belts that I worked with, they, they didn't recognize it right away. Um, it was actually a little orange belt girl. Mm. Lightly after working with me, said, where do you teach at? Mm. And I was like, shh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> it's fun to do that, isn't it? I've done that it before. Is. I've done Absolutely. that whenever, whenever I step into a new school as a student, if they don't know me, you know, and it doesn't happen often, but, you know, I show up, I wear a white belt or nothing. Mm -hmm. And part of what I use to gauge is how do they interact with me? Yeah. yeah. Do they look at me and say, hmm, you might know some things. Right. Tell me your story, because I think as an instructor, you've got to ask that question. Because yes. how do you best teach that student? That student knows they know stuff. They've come in wanting to learn more stuff, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you don't ask, ask that question, how can you best support them? Absolutely. Um, I, and I feel a lot of times I, I visit schools as a consumer, as a customer, because I have friends and family in different areas. And I go, well, I, I want to go to a school. What do I look for? And I try to help them like you know, with that experience by going there just like them with pretending to kind of know nothing just to see how the uh instructors interact whether it's a day class or a night class because sometimes that that changes as well sure sure and to see if people can pick up on okay he might have had some experience do we uh you know approach him differently do you know if if i come in with all the regalia the belt and everything i'm definitely going to get a different response so mm -hmm. i don't want that response i want a natural organic response just to see how they are yeah 
Yeah. So what was it? I said, I, I speculated, was I, was it Kempo? I speculated. Yes. I speculated something. Yes. And, uh, and it's your Chinese goju. Uh, USA goju, Pan American USA goju. goju specifically with, with my okay. instructor, um, okay. which we, we have elements of Okinawan goju and Japanese goju kai, but we are, our base art is USA goju. Okay. Cause you did, you didn't move like any, you know, rigid goju practitioner I, yeah yes i've worked with before I've, I've been around a bit yes he was he was moving he was fluid and at first i was like is this guy kung fu and i was like no he's not kung fu but you could see it from there yes yeah ha, ha, i spent half that session working with everyone and the other half trying to figure out what you did <laughs> well you know i've i've traveled to a lot of schools um you know i'm i've never been the person to like go tournament hopping and make friends that way yeah. i've always gone to a dojo door to door i say hey yeah you know, if it's okay can i train can i work with you guys i don't you know I'll come in very simple and playing and earn my friendship mm -hmm. you know and and i've been to many kung fu schools i've been to shotokan schools i've been to judo schools jujitsu schools and i spend quite a bit of time with everybody We'll, we'll talk in a moment about that attitude, that openness to cross training, because I think that that's an important part of your story. And I think it's the place that you and I really connect the most. Mm -hmm. But before we do that, we've got to figure out the how, the when, the where, you know, so episode or rather issue zero, issue one of your comic book as a martial artist. You know, what's, mm -hmm. what's the story there? Um, so I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. Um, always was a fan of martial arts. My dad used to have us watch like Saturday morning Kung Fu theater, yeah. you know, things on a sci-fi channel, bring home movies for us, me and my brother to watch. And I was always enamored with that world of martial arts. And one day when I was, uh, like 11 or 12, I asked my mom, can I join martial arts class? Mm. And to my surprise, cause she said no for everything. Um, she said, yes. And there happened to be a local karate school. Why do you think she said yes? Um, I don't think she's ever seen me that excited about something. Okay. You know, I, I was good at sports. I was decent at school. I I had a talent for things if I put my mind to it. But it was the first thing that, like, she saw a passion. Mm -hmm. and, and she said, you know, let me nurture this passion. She had put me in things before, like uh, piano lessons, tennis, uh, football, you know, other sports didn't really resonate with me, even though I was good at them I, as much as just like how, that world of martial arts. Mm. I, 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 you know, we had just come from seeing uh, Rumble in the Bronx and I was just like, okay, now is probably the best time for me to ask. And she went straight ahead with it. And it was probably the best thing, you know, for my journey that could have happened. Mm. Right on. Okay. Uh, so you get in there and I'm, I'm going to guess that you loved it from moment one. Oh yeah. I, you know, I remember distinctly that when I signed up, I signed up for a Matsubaya Shishoren uh, school that was nearby and it was four kids with me. And those kids had come from watching Power Rangers and they were just like, you know, I'm going to come in here and learn flying sidekicks. That's great. I could care less. I was, in love with the fact that I saw people cleaning the, the boards by running with rags. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh, I want to do that. And, you know, we spent three months learning how to do a reverse punch. And I'm like, this is the greatest day of my life mm -hmm. every day. And those kids ended up quitting because yeah. you know they, they wanted that flying sidekick and it didn't come so easily. And I was just so in love with the process. You know, I, I walked a half a mile in my gi in a bad neighborhood back and forth every day didn't even phase me that, you know, what was going on in my world. I was just like, I can't wait to go to class every day. Mm. Okay. And, you know, so did the class end up being you and the instructor eventually? Um, or did other children come in? Other children came in as I went up, uh, like as I got to like yellow and orange, they actually okay. shoved me along with the brown belts because I was staying there, like, you know, every class. I'd come in for the first kids' class and leave at the adults' class, uh, mostly because it was cold outside. And I, <laughs> you know, I said, let me get as much work as I can before I, before I go back outside. Yeah. But uh, it, it was a great experience. Um, my New York experience did get cut short because my mom went to school, uh, got a, went to get her PhD in Florida. 
mm-hmm. um, around the time that I was like 12, 13 ish. So we moved. What, what's your what's your PhD in? Uh, child psychology. Oh, okay. Uh, that that might come back around. Keep going. Yeah. So she went to pursue that in Florida. I had to make a choice, go with her, stay with my dad. I went with her. And, uh, you know, when I first got to Florida, I didn't know what to expect. I mm-hmm. I had family. I found out that I had family that did martial arts. Uh, some mm-hmm. of my uncles were Florida State champions. I had no idea oh, up until that part. And so that helped keep it alive. And she said, well, go look for schools, go look around. And uh, I, I found like a couple of schools that may not have been my cup of tea. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, some that had a little bit more insane regimens to go to. And then eventually I found my instructor, uh, Armando Colburn. At the time, his school had two instructors, one that taught, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and the other, he taught Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Mm-hmm. I went to every class every day. All Six classes. days a week. Yeah. Yeah. Because How was old just, are you at this time? This is now like 14, 15. Okay. Now we're getting this into it. This was your it. thing. Yeah. So it was high school. I, tr- I tried football for a little while. I just kept wanting to go to class, to karate class. So I dropped football, went to martial arts. Um, I was loving the lessons because like my instructor was more kind. He was strict firm but fair the other instructor was very much about the fitness aspects Mm. of things uh, very aggressive about that and uh i wanted more technical knowledge so i i kind of stayed with my instructor on those tuesday thursday and saturdays a bit longer Uh, eventually the other instructor left to open his own school i stayed with my instructor and i've been with him all the way through um when i finished high school i ended up going back to college in new york and I was a brown belt at the time. And it was re- that was probably one of the hardest decisions I ever had to make because I was just, you know, I didn't want to be away from the dojo. And I, when I came back to go to college, I actually went back to my first school. And what was that and, experience like? Interesting. It's like it's like graduating from college and going back to public school. If I mean it sounds a little harsh. Mm-hmm. But the way that I had been trained up until that point to come back there was an instance where we were doing our warm up and I was doing what I consider a warm up. And even the black belts were like, Hey, you know, take it easy. You're going a little save some energy for the rest. And I'm like, I'm, I'm not tired. I don't know what you guys are talking about. So I noticed that there was a gap there and, and that made life a little more difficult because I still didn't find the equivalent. Sure. Uh, you know, so I took a break from martial arts to go through college, uh, in my third year of college, my instructor from my, from South Florida called and said, hey, um, I'm going to test you for black belt in six months. I hope you've been practicing. And I was like, ah, that's, that's a good one. <laughs> and I, I hadn't been. You know, I panicked. I flew to Florida, trained with him for a couple of weeks, recorded everything, went home, trained every single day for those mm-hmm. six months. Didn't go outside, didn't talk to my friends, didn't, didn't want to be bothered. I was like, I have to focus. And then I went to Georgia, took my first day and test, passed with flying colors. And, you know, they were shocked that somebody far away distance learning still kept up. And I was like, well, it wasn't a keep up. It's more like I crammed and focused in that span of time. But, you know, the desire to get that achievement was there. And I made sure once I had gotten that first day that I would never take another gap like that again and i would stay involved in the arts mm. okay mm. <sighs> the way you talked about this first school in yeah. new york mm-hmm. versus the way you talked about it when you went back yeah was that difficult yes emotionally and oh. and, and and i want to prep i want to tell the audience what i'm what i saw you know because mm-hmm. most of the, most of our listeners are our listeners they're they're not viewers so they may mm-hmm. not have seen in your face what i saw mm-hmm. which was i thought the world of this yes. and then i realized it did not occupy the the position that i thought it did that yes. i had to uh, that I had to kind of square peg round hole the way I looked at my original training. 
Absolutely. Now, you know, I have a lot of respect for my original instructor. He was sure. very traditional, very thorough. Um, the environment was good for me at the time. And I had nothing to compare it to. Mm -hmm. So when now when I'm in another environment where I'm, I would say it's a much more loving environment, per se, mm -hmm. which is the opposite of what you think of in martial arts. Um, just very kind, very, you know, we're going to push you, but it's not going to beat you to death kind of thing. But I grew tremendously in that in that uh, space. To come back, I wanted to, uh, you know, with a sense of pride, say, look, I've, I've still st kept up with the arts. I want you to be proud of me. But when I looked at there was no progress on their side, I was a little disappointed, a little brokenhearted, mm -hmm. you know, because I expected them to be vastly better than me when I came back. Because I figured, you know, my always assumption is if I don't see you, you're, you're still growing. And so when I come back and you're not, that was a little, little bit of a tough pill to swallow because it put me in a position where I didn't know, I, I didn't fit in now. And, and that was a little hard to deal with. You got on the moving sidewalk while they were walking along the concourse. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I've, I've experienced that. I get it. And it's, you know, martial arts is, is, is kind of a rare place where we evaluate people for their character, but also for their skill. And those mm -hmm. things are independent, right? You've probably known instructors as I've had where I tremendously respect their skill or yes. maybe their teaching abilities, but they are horrible human beings. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And, 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 but when we're talking about someone or, or in this case, some people that you love, mm -hmm. And now that's that's a tough conflict. I love you, but you suck. <laughs> right. And and I will never say things like, you know, I could probably beat them up or anything, but it's just like there is no progress in how they're teaching or there is no progress. There's no growth in those students that I might have left. You know, like, you know, if you were at a higher position than me when I left and I come back and I'm at a slightly higher position than what I left you should be way ahead of me. You know, like I should still be coming in like, man, I can't wait for you to show me stuff. Yeah. And they're looking to me. Yeah, I was going to ask, did they, re did they recognize it? So if yeah. they recognized it, were there conversations around how? Did somebody come to you and say, how are you so much better? Uh, one of the instructors uh, that, that was there, he usually steps in and out, but he was there that day and he mm -hmm. was just like, what have you been doing? Like, this is a huge growth. And um, I just said, I've been just showing up every day to class, just like I was here. You know, I, I didn't think I was doing anything in particular, you know, um, I will give like my, my instructor, uh, my sensei now a, a huge credit because there was something he did to me that showed me an impressive character trait. Uh, when I came in, you know, I, I was, you know, beginner intermediate level of this Matsubayashi Shorinru, nothing of Goju. Um, and, and I was holding on to that. I was just mm. like, yeah, you know, I'm gonna learn your stuff, but also remember I got this and a, and a tournament came up relatively soon. He said, would you like to go? I said, sure. I, he said, well, do you like to practice, you know, some of the forms you want? He was like, no, I was like, no, I'm gonna do these, these forms. And he taught me one anyway, but he said, do what you want. I went to the tournament. I performed my Shorinru, uh, I think it was like Pinan Yandan or something. And I tied with somebody. And at that moment, I said, you know what? I'll try one of the Goju forms that he taught me. The only problem is I didn't really practice it that well. So I messed up. Because he didn't up think you were going to use it. Right. And I, I, I messed up the form and I lost. And he never like admonished me. He just said, see you in class. And I said, okay. And I said, you know, maybe when I'm in this space, I play by these rules. I'll put away my other stuff and focus on what you're teaching me. And that has always been a valuable trait, like empty my cup and, and, and you know, be ready for it to be filled. And he's always treated me like that. We all need to have that moment, right? Mm -hmm. If, if we come out of some martial arts tradition where we're happy with what we've been doing and life takes us away, mm -hmm. 
it's not easy to just say, I'm going to set all of this down. I'm going to pretend I am not this person, that I am not this training, that I don't have these relationships, that this didn't make my life better. And I'm going to start over and just wipe the slate. Uh But for most of us, we end up with some moment like you're talking about where we realize it's important to be able to do that. doesn't mean you can't pick it back up again. Right. But the ability to be able to fully put it down mm-hmm. is so valuable. Oh, I 100% agree. Um, it's it's made a world of difference in my life outside of martial arts and within it. Mm-hmm. Um, to have that's why I like going to dojos and humbling myself and training in their style. You don't need to make it special for me. I just need you to. I just want to be a part of what you're doing. And let me just fully absorb that and and support what you're doing in that space as well. Mm. All right. So if I if I've got the timing right, so school mm-hmm. in New York, you come back, take mm-hmm. and pass your first dawn, you go back to New York. Mm-hmm. For a little bit. Um okay. at that point, uh we're getting I guess now we're getting close to, at least as far as my mind, uh closer to nine eleven time. Mm. I had a couple of setbacks in, in with my family. I had a death in the family. Uh, my grandmother's house burned down. Oh no! Uh, it just there was just a lot of stuff going on at the time. Um, I took a <laughs> took a like a mental sabbatical and went to live with my uncle in Buffalo for a few months. Mm-hmm. And then my mom had asked me to move back because she had a um, health issue, uh, which which required surgery. And she wanted me to come and like visit and just take care of her. Mm-hmm. I said, sure. I, I stayed for a couple weeks. I worked at the job that she worked at, uh, which was a physical therapy company. They offered me a full-time job. I said, well, sure. I'm not doing anything in particular in New York. Uh, it gives me a chance to come back and train. I love it. And so I moved back, jumped right back into training. I was there all the time. Now we're teaching. Uh, you know, we're in a different location, bigger space. Now, you know, I'm working with my sensei's sons. We're all also black belts. So we're all like, we're training with each other. We're teaching. We're having a great experience as we're going on. Um, this is now close to, I want to say 2004. Mm-hmm. And uh, I went, I went to, I did a lot of tournaments. Didn't really care for the process, the politics wasn't for me. Still had a good time. I had a great experience. I won't take that away. My last tournament was the US Open. I said, I'm going to go there, try my best, leave it on a table, retire. And for done. folks who don't know about the, the competitive, the sport martial arts landscape, mm-hmm. uh, the US Open is one of the biggest, if yes. not the biggest in the US. Absolutely. Uh, usually about 40,000, 50,000 competitors hundreds of divisions, people come from all over the world. That's like where the who's who of sport uh, karate go to compete at. And it was in Orlando. So I, I figured eh, I could drive up there. No one knows me. I, I went by myself, nobody else in my dojo, um, which was always a theme. I would go to tournaments by myself. I just wanted to see what was going on or where I'm at. And I think I think I might have placed like fourth in my divisions. But at, at that time, the 18 to 29 division had like a 60 people in it. Learning the rules of that was also educational. Um I met a lot of people there after my performances. They And if I if I remember if I've got the timing right on this, that was a fairly stacked division then too. Yeah, you I don't had, know if you're gonna and, name drop. I, I I wouldn't be able to, but I couldn't remember a bunch of them, but like a Johnny Tension was competing there or Mike Chat students were there. Those guys were in that space. Yeah. I didn't know any of them at all until after, you know, until once I was done competing. Once I competed, completely done with it. I was like, cool, I'm happy with my life. Just go back to my dojo and train. Um, I say you want to fast forward maybe six months to a year. A documentary comes out called Extreme Martial Arts. And... I knew what it was. I was like, that sounds dumb. I don't, I don't, wanna, I don't care to watch it. And my mom was like, you sure? I'm like, yeah, I'm good. And I was at a friend's house and he said, Hey, I'm going to put this documentary on. I didn't know what he was talking about, but I saw the logo and I'm like, Oh, great. 
and we're going to watch this. And they're talking about Mike Chat student at the U.S. Open. Still wasn't connecting anything. I looked at the, the pictures. I go, oh, I think that's the, I, I went to one of those. And then I saw my face. <laughs> and I was like, no, I don't remember them having cameras. And then they're, you know, they're doing their little segments where it's chopped up and I see me performing. And I'm like, huh, weird. And I see me performing again. I'm like, huh, that's, that's different. And from just those little segments, my phone started call and blowing up. People were like, I saw you on TV. And I was like, oh no. Because <laughs> my first thought was it brought me way too much attention. Mm. And in, in South Florida at that time, people saw you, you know, getting a leg up, they're gonna come and challenge you. So, you know, that Monday on the weekend, there's a lot of people at the dojo going, Hey, I saw you on TV, I want to fight you. Mm. And I was like, Okay, and let, let's let's do it. And it times you know okay and, and you you have in in the limited time that we've had together you've struck me as someone who is humble yes but is aware of of themselves yes right so i i suspect that you know what you're what you're prefacing there is you know i i wasn't going to go looking for these challenges but if they're going to come find me I'm going to handle it. Absolutely. Um, I I, want, I would like to believe that my dojo was in the last era of those like dojo challenges where you go to other schools and you mm -hmm. spar um, because my, my sensei would bring me around sometimes just me, sometimes me and his son. We go to these other dojos, we train, fight, whatever to everybody, have a good time, keep it going. It was a lot of fun for me. Um, I got to learn a lot fast. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, I was very much a person that I, I won't start anything, but I'll finish everything. Mm. And, and so it was very, um, interesting to have those situations come. Cause that was my immediate reaction when I saw myself. It wasn't like, Hey, cool. It was, Oh no, this is going to draw more attention than I was expecting. Right. And that, and, and it did. Mm. Okay. So what, what next? What happened after that? Um, so, you know, I had my second Dan test and my third Dan consecutively. For our, our organization, typically we go to Georgia where our grandmaster is and we mm -hmm. have like a camp. And then, on you know, they test you during the camp. And on the last day you fight in a tournament, all of that rolls into how uh, you're, you're graded. Uh, so that was my second, third and fourth Dan over the six or seven, eight years over this period of time. Mm -hmm. um, it was just a lot of teaching, uh, seminars. I would go and do demos for my school, my sensei school. Um, in between there, I went back to college uh, for computer programming, found that wasn't exactly my cup of tea. I could do it. I just, it was just so boring. Mm -hmm. And- um, Also my went, degree is in. Right. And, you know, after like a couple semesters of making bank programs, I was like, I'm good. I, I don't I don't like num numbers that much. Um, and then I end up uh, going to school for massage. And my first thought with massage is, well, if I beat people up and break things, I probably should know how to fix it. Which is and, very much the Chinese philosophy to this. Yeah. yeah. And, and then, like, in my mind, I, I started to picture what I'd be doing. I would be helping martial artists because they're the most stubborn, the right. most likely to avoid care. But, like, these are the people that I could leverage my knowledge with the most. And they're also the toughest people to get on the table. So mm. a lot of times I'm like, all right, I will fight you. <laughs> and then, then you can get on the table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's many people in Orlando that will tell you that very thing that like I have the table and you go eh. I'm like all right well I'm gonna put my gloves on for a few minutes and then we'll see if you want to get on this table and then they're like okay we'll get on this table it's it's the it's the weirdest um you know kind of surprise like I'm just envisioning this tv show where it's like I'm gonna fight you and then I'm gonna massage you mm-hmm Right. Like there's just there's I, I, I've always appreciated the juxtaposition. We've had a lot of people on the show who, you know, they generally start in some kind of martial art and then they have a similar 
light bulb to you and saying, oh, maybe I should understand a bit of how to how to help people. And honestly, I think a lot of us pick up that stuff just from our own injuries. You know, we, we end up learning a lot of that because, you know, if you're constantly yeah. getting banged up, you got to figure out how to how to heal at least for next class. Right. Oh, for sure. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I got to pick up, like I'm on the U.S. martial arts team and when we traveled to different areas as a team, I would notice we had no one to support us for the sports medicine side. You know, uh, uh, recently we have like a sports nurse and PTA and, and people who are very capable now, but that was my first thought initially. And I was mm -hmm. like, um, I would love to help, but also I have to compete. So in the times that I wasn't competing, I have to now try to help these people. And I was like, we need something like this regularly. Every professional team has somebody that's there for their sports medicine side to take care of those athletes. If we want to be considered professional and to that next level, we need people taking care of us. We need to have those things in place. And that's something I wanted to push for um, more often. So I figured, let me go to dojos on, Spire, on fight night and put a table in the back and or on fighting seminars, you know, maybe let me convince the parents. And then I'll convince the athletes and vice versa. So it, it, that started to make it a little bit more uh, popularized. Yeah, I, I think for so many people, even still, even here in 2023, cresting 2024, the term mm -hmm. massage instantly makes them think relaxation, luxury, mm -hmm. uh, indulgent. And yeah. it can be, but it doesn't have to be. Yeah. Uh, one of one of my. Uh, favorite people to pick his brain on is uh ross levine who is yeah. the current middleweight champion for karate combat who yeah. is a physical therapist and he understands the importance of maintaining the body for uh performance and for recovery so he knows exactly what what how i view things and uh sure. and you know we'll, we'll talk from time to time about that stuff because i would love for him to come and rehab my achilles or something <laughs> It'd be great, um, just like I can help him with any musculoskeletal issue he has. And, you know, I think there'll be bigger crossover the more that it becomes more integrated, uh, having that sports medicine uh, aspect of looking for um, performance, you know, progress through work like this. So that way we can continue to live our lives as martial artists for as long as possible. Yeah. You know, I... I... I've always seen the value in taking care of the body, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it, whether that's how I was raised by my mother or in the martial arts school or both, or just people around me. And you look at pro athletes and I had always assumed that pro athletes were investing tremendously in their body and they're, they don't, mm -hmm. no. some of them do, Yes. you know, but, and, and when I realized how big of a deal this was, it was how big of a deal everybody made about LeBron James and what he does. And I went, don't you all do that? No. Because I just did the math on everything. And most of the time, like even the second tier players in the NBA can afford this. Yes. And they're uh, not investing. And it just makes me think if my body is my paycheck, mm -hmm. why would I not invest in it? And I, I, I think it's like a cultural thing where when, if you've come from money, you might understand it differently versus not coming from money. When you when you had when you haven't come from money and now you have it, you're not sure what to spend it on yet. If you have somebody to help you, you'll learn. Like somebody like LeBron, like Kobe, um, Russell Wilson, spend millions of dollars on taking care of their body so that they can perform. Martial artists typically are not balling out of control, nope. so they don't they don't think about it. Um, you know, my boxing coach, uh, JT uh, James Taylor, at Technique Boxing, phenomenal athlete was a pro boxer even for him it took him a little bit for me to convince him to get some treatments mm -hmm. and then he started getting them when he was preparing for his fights and saw a difference and now like i work with his gym to take care of some of those athletes and those are the guys that we and i joke with like some of the uh, up and coming national ranked uh fighters when they come to see me I'll work on them. And then I say, get up, see how you feel. You say, I feel good. Okay, we'll put the gloves on. Let's go in the garage yeah. and let's see how you really feel. Yeah. We'll all come to the, to the gym and say, let's get in the, in the box, in the ring 
and see how we do and see how you feel. And that's how you know, because I'm going to give you that real time uh, feedback right now. And there's very few people like me who can just turn around and go do that. Yeah. It's, you know, the, the there's a place for the attitude that a lot of us have been instilled with uh, around powering through, suck mm -hmm. it up, oh. try, grit it out. Yes. But there's also a point where applying that 24 seven just doesn't work. And if Absolutely. the goal is results or if the goal is to remain healthy, if, and, and, and I, I, I would put a bunch of money down that we're on the same page on this, but we might have some folks out there who aren't going to agree with me. I'm going to say this point blank. Mm -hmm. If the way you train leaves you injured, you are less able to protect yourself and your, your whole attitude about let's go hard self-defense is actually counterproductive. Absolutely. I mean, you're not going to tell them, wait, hold on, let me stretch out first before we have this altercation. So you always have to be ready, like that saying of, if you're always ready, you never have to get ready. So destroying yourself on an ongoing basis is not going to help you be ready. Mm -hmm. um, even I, I listen to a lot of like MMA videos where people are just going like 100% and they're sparring. And I'm, I'm like, no, you're going to have to go and fight for money soon. Mm -hmm. Do not destroy yourself before you get there. And you have to be more practical. Like That's why I'm a huge fan of somebody like Demetrius Johnson, Mighty Mouse who is very smart about how he trains, how he prepares, and how he takes care of himself. And the results speak for themselves for him. There's a martial art where you were expected to go 100% all the time and compete frequently. And it's called Muay Thai. And if the numbers in my head are still accurate, two-year career. The average yeah. career of a professional Muay Thai fighter in Thailand is two years. Now, mm. if you want to go 100% to the wall and, and that's your glory, fine. But yeah. I'd like my body to serve me till I'm 100. Like, I, yeah. I want to be 100 and train. That's my Absolutely. goal. Absolutely. So I got to um, approach yeah. it differently. Yes. I speak with my instructor every day, um, pretty much. And we talk about that. You know, if he's saying, oh, you know, my back's off. I'm a little stiff today. And I'm like, here, try these mobility exercises. Call me later. Tell me how you did. And then do this. And then, you know, and so I want him to be around. And I want myself to be around. So we work and we push each other at mm. this stage so that we can stay healthy and active and not have i've already had two injuries that were karate related and i've never been injured in my life and they both weren't things that i caused <laughs> you know I, I tore my acl 10 years ago and i tore my achilles last year mm. and you know those are things that i now stay on top of like try to stay on top of everything now yeah it's too much dynamic movement too much too much dynamic force no. all the bouncing <laughs> but, <laughs> it's probably from that but you know i would yeah. imagine that you've learned so much about your body coupled with your understanding of the body that yes. you're more resilient now probably even the non-injured sides absolutely are even better um, it, it, it's always fun because no one ever suspects that my knowledge of the anatomy i would use like in sparring but if I'm having a day where I want to have fun, I'm going to start poking things. Like, and I and I tell I tell this story often. I have um, one of the black belts in my sensei school. He's very fast, but he's a little cocky. He'll 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 know what I'm talking about. But like I'll like jab him or stick him in the pack a few times, and that doesn't hurt per se. But if you get re repeated exposure. This is the, also the same muscle you need to throw your punches. Mm -hmm. So now your punches get slower or sloppier. Mm -hmm. He's not even sure what's going on at that point. And I'm like, oh, man, what happened? Why are you used to be? Are you tired? <laughs> you know, now I get to mess with them and bring them down to a little bit slower than I can beat them up properly. Right. So, yeah, <laughs> understanding the body, just to all of you out there, understanding the body isn't just for pressure points. Mm -hmm. Understanding the body has tremendous value. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I wish that my whole clientele was just martial artists because those are the easiest people for me to understand. Mm. I know no matter the, the discipline, I know what you're going through at whichever stage that you're hurt and when, what caused it and how to prevent it. And those are people I would love to help. They're also, you know, the most stubborn. I, I love, maybe love is the wrong word. I appreciate having body work done. And I've got a collection that I've put together here in Vermont of wonderful people that are good at various things. You know, this person's a, a, a wonderful 
wonderful diagnostics and this person's good for this and that. And yes, they come to appreciate me because I have an understanding of my body and, and will be. So how did that happen? And I'm there and I'm, I'm doing kata or I'm doing something or, yeah, you know, right. I was doing this kick and, you know, sometimes it, it gets, you know, for both of us, we get kind of nerdy with it. And I, oh, I dig yeah. it, you know, and it's not only am I getting worked on, but I'm learning at the same time. And I just think that's the best. Absolutely. And, I, and I've come to appreciate that, like, physical therapists and stuff in general are not familiar with the art or the sport of martial arts. So the, the requirements athletically, they're not familiar with. So I had a great time with my physical therapist when I was explaining to him, yes, I need this to be strong, but these are the movements I'm going to be doing. Mm -hmm. So I need you to help me make sure that these movements are going to make sure that nothing falls apart. And you know, I would go and I perform katas or I do techniques to turns and twist stances and things that they go, okay, now that they can understand it a little bit better. Yeah. So hopefully now when they get another martial artist in there, they go, okay, I remember this. This should mm -hmm. be a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's, because I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to guess I'm preempting something you've already thought of. There's mm -hmm. got to be like a, a, a certificate program or something because a, a way of teaching PTs, OTs, LMTs, how to work with martial artists. That would be wonderful. I would love and to. And you could do it. You yeah, could be yeah. the guy. Absolutely. This would That would be a great thing if I could uh, teach that. Just And even have somebody like a Ross or whatever, because, you know, they like to see the fancy credentials of PT and, and all that stuff. So they you all, know, um, all those industries need CEUs, right? Absolutely. And I think that would be wonderful just because it's so different from any other sport. Yeah. You know, it, it has everything and nothing to do with it at the same time. For sure. Mm -hmm. All right. So what are the things you said? Here you are. You've been training a while. Yeah. You you've accomplished some things. Yes. You have some skill. I can vouch for that. <laughs> but if I heard you correctly you don't have your own school and that's a bit unconventional yes talk to me um, about that so it, it's been offered many times over over my career um uh, i think because of the nature of what i do for massage that makes it really difficult for me to have a school because i was working at a time with many professional sports teams so there was required a lot of travel mm -hmm. and that that means i wouldn't have any i wouldn't be able to teach because i'd be gone mm -hmm. and i i think the investment of of a school was very daunting to me yeah can be uh, and, and i've i've taught at schools and i do private lessons and i still do private lessons um i in, in some spaces i like the private lessons because to have that intimate one-to-one -one, you know some people have issues when they're performing in groups so they like to just have the one-on-one -on -one instruction there are some people that i teach that i feel like would benefit from the group and i i'm not gonna lie being in like florida now makes it easier for me to just say go see my instructor who has mm. a place and go see him because i i think i'm pretty good at what i do and how i break things down but he has a, a component that I do not in the, in the sense that his his heart is so accessible. He's such a loving environment and that's different from the one on one. You know, and I feel like it's more beneficial to for me to send people to him or if they prefer the one on one, I'll train them all the way through and I'll eventually bring them there. But um, I haven't really settled as to where is my home completely. Whenever I find that, I probably will open a school. Do you think, have you thought about how you might know where your home is? Um, I would have no desire to leave it. It's yeah. a feeling rather yeah. than, than articulable. No, we're not talking check boxes. We're talking about gut. Yeah. And, and I think over the years I've watched the market for martial arts schools kind of little volatile depending on where you are um you know where it comes to ebbs and flows and and you get people who are distracted by other sports and what you're trying to teach how the public receives it and whatnot mm -hmm. um it was much easier 
for me from a financial standpoint to focus on massage mm -hmm. makes sense and and build that career to be like ultra successful because one of the things i think i is a challenge for me is that if that's my sole job then like that's that's all my money is in there and i, I have a hard time with that because when bad times are bad they're bad and I like having the ability to be successful at massage mm -hmm. and me teach from a point of love, okay. like just because I want to. And so that's kind of where I'm at now, where if I can get enough and I'm doing pretty well with the massage stuff. So I, I can get to a point where now I don't have to jack up prices for training and all that other stuff that, that some people do because they want the money or because it's expensive where they are. I want to keep it reasonable for people to train, to, to just let them have the love of it, just like I did. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So if we put massage aside, we put, you know, who knows where you're going to settle aside, who knows about opening mm -hmm. a school aside. If we talk about you as a yeah. martial artist, not a martial mm -hmm. arts instructor, but yes. you in your own training, which I know is important to you. And I, in, in a way that I, I will acknowledge, I, I, I think it is more important to you than, than most. That's just, yes. that's just what I, what I've experienced in, in our conversations. What are you doing to make sure you are developing in the way you want to develop? Cause it's um, gotta be more than I go to class. That doesn't yes. sound like your approach. Oh no. Um, what I enjoy most about my instructor is he comes and presents situations to me to challenge my way of thinking or to challenge my approaches because every, I, I don't even know how many years, but let's say there's a cycle where my instructor says, okay, my focus wants to be, we need to get these guys self-defense ready, or we have a bunch of people that want to compete and they do this ready. Or, and every cycle he presents me these these interesting situations and asks if I want to be a part of it, what my feedback is. And I give him that and we have a little back and forth mm -hmm. about it. Um, and and that's also a part of like why I go to other schools. I want to see how people are doing things and if sure. there's something uh, to learn. Like uh, a, a bunch of years ago, I happened to be in California working with the women's national team. Took a break uh, for a couple of days and went dojo hopping. Uh, two dojos told me no to come in and train, which is the first time I was ever, I've ever been told no. And I was like, you know, okay, you know, I, I, I can't do anything about that. Um, on my GPS, I saw a Machi Machida logo. And I was like, what are the odds that he would even be there? He's, you know, popular guy. But I asked him if it was okay if I could come by. They said, yeah, absolutely. I asked him if it was okay to train. Uh, his brother Shinzo was there. He said, come on in, you know, and let me train with them for a week. And I was very impressed by how they were organized and structured and how they did their classes, the Shotokan style, how he adapted it for like all combatives and different levels. And I learned a lot in that space, just, you know, in awe of how they did it, trying, you know, I put the fandom aside because, you know, the dad was there too. And um, I was just, you know, I loved every second of being like a student mm -hmm. again and and not like, yeah, I have that sixth stand and that's great. But I like being the student and, and it's so much fun to interact in those spaces. So I try to look at disciplines that I've always wanted to, you know, pay a visit to and observe or learn from, or, you know, I try to build connections with people so that I go, hey, can we train together? Because I love different perspectives. I'm never a person that's going to say, you know, this karate is better than this art or that art or whatever. To me, you have to make it work on the individual level. So it doesn't matter how good the art, well, how good people view the art. It's always the individual. So if I see somebody that's like a kickboxing champ, I'm going to want to test myself against that kickboxing champ because I want to see what makes them unique and can I overcome it or can I adapt something from it? And so I do that quite often, whether it's with kata or weapons or uh, fighting, point fighting, kickboxing, whatever, it doesn't matter the style. I'm always open for that perspective to, to learn it. Nice. Okay. Mm -hmm. If people want to get in touch with you, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. Florida's a big state. Where, where are you? Uh, currently, I'm bouncing between like South Florida 
in Orlando. Okay. And that's because my mom lives in South Florida and so does my instructor. And I have many massage clients in Orlando. Okay. So if, yeah. if folks are in the Orlando or South Florida area and they want to get in touch with you and they're like, you know, I, I, I've been suffering with X, Y, Z and none of the folks around me can put me back yeah. together again. You know, yeah. how do they get a hold of you? So you yeah. might be able to play. Um, so they can visit my website, which is www.massagepromed.com. Um, I'm also on social media on Instagram and uh, TikTok. We're under Massage Pro Med. And um, I have uh, my work number on there, which is 352-577-2252. They can use any of those methods to book a session with me. I'm pretty mobile as it stands. So I come to people's homes and fix them up. And um, only some people will I fight if it's at a dojo. <laughs> <laughs> You you have to find a way to invent a new term instead of dojo storm, like massage storm. Yes. You got, there's, there's just got to be something in there you can work with. That'd be fun. Right on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this has been great, man. I, I, you know, the type of conversation I'd expected. I know you've got so many more stories. We didn't even really get into the stories. So we're going to have to have yeah. you back for a part two where we're just, absolutely. you know, we, we chew through some of those. Oh, yes. But, like this. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let let me throw it to you. Close us up. I'll chat just briefly after. What What do you want to leave the audience with today? What do you want them to take away from our conversation? Um, you know, beginnings can occur from anything. You know, if you when you're young and you're watching these action movies, cartoons, and things, don't think that you can't do it. And you can definitely start even from there just that inspiration can be the single spark that flames a whole new way of approaching life um never be afraid to challenge yourself and to try new things and you just seek out improvement in in your in your daily life in your work life in your home life um because at, at the end of the day martial arts is designed to help you be a better person and that's what you want to cultivate. So push yourself every day, even if it's just 1%. And I think you'll uh, get to your goals faster than you think. Awesome. Couldn't have said it better myself. 1% compounded over a year is actually a lot of, lot of progress. Absolutely. So to the audience out there, please go follow Des. Check out what he's doing. If you're in his area and you're not taking him up on massage, you're, you're missing out. I will, I will tell you that. For sure. I'll, I'll find you. Yeah, he's going to find you. He's going to massage storm you, whatever that means at this point. We don't know yet, but he'll Absolutely. he'll come up with something. If you want the full show notes, whistlekickmarsportsradio.com. And don't forget whistlekick.com for all the things that we do. Thank you for tuning in. And we'll bring you another episode soon. Thanks for being here, Des. Thank you. Thank you.